This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. What are human rights? Some people have said that freedom of speech is a human right. Others have said that private property is a human right. And still others have said that education, healthcare, and housing are human rights. But then there have also been people in government who have argued quite successfully that we should invade other countries to ensure that people around the world enjoy their own human rights. This week's guest is the historian of this very curious and often lethal idea known as human rights. This is my interview with Samuel Moyne. So I am here, well, I'm in Oakland, um, but Samuel Moyne here, Sam Moyne is in New Haven because he's a professor at Yale, both in the law school and in the history department. Although Sam and I were once colleagues at Columbia in a way. Well, yes, we were. You were, at, you were a professor in history at Columbia and I was a professor in history and American studies at Barnard across the street, although we never met each other then. And then I left after a few years and then you stayed at Columbia and then uh, made quite a name for yourself in history, international relations, and I guess in law too. Um, with your works on human rights, the history of human rights, and then you ended up at Yale just a couple of years ago, right? Or not, and, and I shouldn't say ended up, but you, you moved over to Yale a couple of years ago. Yeah. Who knows, who knows where, you're, where you'll end up, right? <laughs> well, I know that for sure, in the ground. Yeah, so um, whew, where do we begin? So I've been writing this book, as you know, on the history of American foreign policy, and human rights, of course, is uh, an important part of that history, no matter how you write it. Uh, so I've grappled with a lot of the issues that you've been grappling with pretty much full time for more than a decade now. Um, I've been doing it part time for a while, but I, I know some of the stuff, you know, not nearly as well as you do. And I have um, critiques of what's called human rights and then critiques, especially of how it's been enacted in, in forms such as what's called humanitarian intervention. Yeah. You have your own critiques. Um, in some ways we overlap and agree, and in other ways we don't. Right. You, I, I would call you, is this fair to say, um, a critical supporter of the concept of human rights? I think that's right. I, I, I wanted to give them some tough love. Um, yeah. at, at the time I started this work, you know, it was like a decades campaign and I've, I've left it behind at this point. Um, I, I really, you know, felt like I was more, you know, tough than, uh, you know, loving. And, and in part because human rights were still extremely popular um, amongst American elites. And it was almost sacrilegious to say uh, something negative about them. Now I think the pendulum has swung. So, you know, I now find myself, you know, a moderate uh, uh, in, in, in the mix of the kind of critical, uh, attacks on it. Okay. So I'm not a moderate. Okay, <laughs> so, yeah. so I, just so you know, I mean, I don't want you to feel like you're ambushed here and I'm not, will not ambush. Oh, you at all. no, please. Uh, let's, uh, hash it out. let's hash it out. But it's, I am only a critic. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. I, but I'm always open to, you know, persuasion on this. Um, so, you know, and if anyone can do it, it's you. So, um, let's, Let's start with 
I think it might be your most recent published piece. I don't know, but on Samantha Power's me- memoir, right? Yeah, that came out pretty recently. Yeah, Fan- American Affairs. Yeah. yeah, everyone should go read this. It's fantastic because uh, I hate Samantha Power. Most listeners of this show hate, hate Samantha Power. Sam is no fan of Samantha Power either. And this is where we very clearly agree. So you want to just talk about that piece and what you argued? Sure. About? So actually, I had not, I'd never written about Samantha Power, though I have talked about humanitarian intervention and various things. Um, and I hadn't planned to write about it, but I had to read her memoir um, because I was writing a chapter for my new book, which is about um, war and American war and its transformation. And there's a chapter on the Obama administration. And I read kind of the memoirs of, of the, uh, you know, Obama's servants, Ben Rhodes and so forth. And mm-hmm. so I read hers. And I, I just was struck by um, how in the kind of haze of image management, there is this kind of deep moral failure to reckon with what she's done, you know, creating a generation, really my generation and, and below that um, really thinks not just of human rights as high deals, but think of um, the the milit- use of American military power to protect civilians from genocide as really like that's the pinnacle mm-hmm. uh, of what we ought to hope can happen. And it's led to disaster in so many places to the point that even if it could have seemed like a good idea at the time, it ought to be abandoned radically now. Mm-hmm. And not only does she not do that, actually there was a moment I show in the piece right when the Iraq war was breaking out, when she was an anti-imperialist, uh, having seen what this concept could do hmm. uh, in, in the hands of George W. Bush and his servants. But not only does she not kind of come to grips with um, what kind of the legacy, but she, she really actively uh, 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 evades it, notably in her treatment of the Libyan intervention mm-hmm. uh, with which she had something to do. Yeah. So for those who don't know, Samantha Power is arguably the leading proponent currently of this concept of human rights and humanitarian interventionism in particular, right? And also probably its leading practitioner, right? (laughs) Or an actor, right? She was behind or pushed hard for many humanitarian interventionist policies, notably Libya under Obama. Uh, But also, I believe, didn't she support the Saudi attack on Yemen? I believe she was part of that. Uh, she, you know, the, 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 I'm not sure that it would be fair to say it was represented as a humanitarian intervention, but she, you know, it's absolutely true that, you know, it's, it's interesting that a lot of liberals are now attacking this war, um, you know, and, you know, MBS and Jared Kushner, buddy, buddy, and so forth and, Mm -hmm. and getting it done. But it it was started by under the Obama administration and, and Ben Rhodes and Samantha power and so forth were, were involved in that. Uh, We've we've talked about this on the show before. There's actually an article in the New York times in 2015, I believe, in which many members of the administration at the time are quoted quoted directly as saying, no, we need to let the Saudis do this because otherwise the Iranians yeah. will gain a toehold in the Gulf and we can't let oh, that happen. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's absolutely about regional geopolitics. Uh, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, but you're right, though. But you're right, though. That is slight, actually slightly unfair to her, I suppose, and that, that probably she wouldn't probably count that as a humanitarian intervention, I don't think. Um, I, I think there was yeah, very little to say in, in that regard. Um, right. Yeah, it might have been other reason, but again, like it's gone south and and grievously so. Right. Uh, so she made her fame. Terms. Right. Sorry. Sorry. She made her fame with this book. Uh, um, what's it called? Road to Hell. Problem from oh. Hell. Problem from Hell. Yeah. Which yeah. came out? When did that come out? That came out uh, right in uh, two thousand three. Right. Um, and. It's, it's, in my mind, very closely associated with the Iraq War. It mm-hmm. won the Pulitzer Prize five weeks into the Iraq War. Oh, man. Um, and it, it really originates in, you know, our youth, her youth in the 90s. And yet she, she told a history of how America's problem was that it stood idly by in the face of despotism and atrocity. And, 
right. you know, has tried to disown some of the, you know, consequences of that view, notably in the midst of the Iraq war when she won the Pulitzer Prize, but, you know, selectively and, and inadequately, especially when she's been involved in, you know, moving from activist to government actor mm-hmm. under, under the Obama administration. And that book used as its prime example, the genocide in Rwanda, right? And argued that the United States and other Western powers should have intervened militarily to stop the genocide in Rwanda. But it, as you said, I didn't even realize this. It came out right with the beginning of the second Iraq war. <laughs> and now here's the thing. Uh, the Iraq war, as you well know, was, you know, one of the major justifications or rationales for it was that it was a humanitarian intervention. To bring, right. to bring human rights to the poor, oppressed Iraqis who suffered right. under the boot of Saddam Hussein. <laughs> right. There's a lot and, of talk about Saddam's rape room and torture chambers and, uh, in those days. and wasn't right. the only rationale, right. uh, like some of the other events, but absolutely it figured. Right. And so eventually, although for a time there in t- 2003, there were many liberals who supported the Iraq war, by the way, but eventually... Everybody soured on it, pretty much, even Republicans. Um, um, and the Rwanda war for liberals became, those who followed Samantha Power anyway, the, would, that would have been the good humanitarian intervention. That would have been the just one. That would have been true to the idea, the concept of, humanitarian inter- of human rights, whereas right. the Iraq war was the bad application of that right. concept, right? In the, in, the, in the current sort of liberal mind. Am I right about that? You know, someone like Susan Rice, very close to Samantha Power, yeah. um, you know, was serving in government at the time of the Rwandan genocide. And she, in particular, kind of came away just regretting inaction. It's very important to mention Kosovo in 1999, because there they did act much more clearly than in Iraq in, in a humanitarian um kind of on a humanitarian rationale mm-hmm. and, and in, in, in the view of those who were there at the time, including me, um, it worked. And so what we didn't realize and, and what they maybe didn't care enough about is that it was paving the way for all these later events, including um, not just under Bush, but under Obama as well. Do you still think the intervention in Kosovo was good? No, uh, I wouldn't say that. Um, you know, I think it was, it, I, I'm not at all, um, I'm very, you know, uncomfortable about the kind of Serbian nationalism we've seen both at the time and um, in spinning its own narratives of the event. But I think that um, it, it, it just judged by its consequences, which we have to, because it sets a precedent. Vladimir Putin's going to cite Kosovo when he goes into Crimea on his humanitarian intervention. Mm -hmm. Um, It leads to kind of optimism about American power that affects Iraq big time, as you've said, but also these other things like Libya and so forth. So um, if we just isolated Kosovo, even then I think it would be seriously problematic um, because what we were doing really was intervening in a civil war. Um, and, you know, it takes two to tango in civil wars. The, you know, Kosovo Liberation Army, you know, uh, you know, we could get into detail, but these are not mm-hmm. kind of nice people. Yeah. Um, and uh, there was, a, there, there, it was a nasty situation. Hard to say what we should have done. Same in Syria. Mm-hmm. There were outrageous atrocities at the at the time, and especially in Syria later. But we, my, my basic, you know, criticism is that it, it it allowing even the possibility of doing it creates the risk of protectual abuse by George W. Bush and by Vladimir Putin. And even if it's a for a good cause, it so almost always goes spectacularly wrong mm-hmm. that we should just you know have a time out until we find a genuinely beneficent power, which I'm afraid uh, our country isn't. Oh yeah. Well, see, I don't think there ever will be such a thing. And I guess that that might be the the root of our disagreement, but let's, let's do this. Let's broaden this a bit and let's just talk about this thing called human rights. And let's talk about, let's talk about how, you know, the ordinary, if there is such a thing, American thinks about the, which is, I would imagine if you asked, ordinary Americans on the street about human rights, they would say a couple things about it. It's good, of yeah. course. And yeah. two, that it's just natural. 
that it comes from nature or God and it's, and therefore there's nothing really to discuss about it. It's just, it's just a given good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And is that probably fair? I mean, yeah, that's right. So I think the historical narrative would be, you know, Thomas Jefferson's rights are come from nature or nature's God Mm -hmm. uh, or at any rate a really long time ago. And they're good. (laughs) You know, Jimmy Carter says in his farewell address there, you know, it wasn't that, Americans invented human rights is that human rights invented America but mm. you know now they're pretty much the same right so, uh, like everything's good if you're watching this there's a pretty decent chance you've either bought CBD in the past or you're going to buy CBD in the future and if you're going to do that you might as well buy it from a company whose values you share and that's willing to give you 25% off. That company is Paloma Verde CBD, a great company out of San Antonio, Texas that's owned by Carlos and Vanessa Abelar. I'm proud to have them as a sponsor of Unregistered for many reasons. First of all, they chose the name Paloma Verde, which means green dove in Spanish because they are peace advocates. Also, they're independent entrepreneurs, and I'm that too, care about that a lot. And they were denied loans, and even accounts by banks because they're a marijuana-related business. But most of all, I love their products. I've been using them for more than a month now. So they have great gummies, terrific soft gels, and in this time when we're washing our hands all the time because of the quarantine, they have tremendous salves and lotions. But my favorite is their tincture. I'm telling you, you put several drops of this under your tongue, your anxiety will melt away. So go to PalomaVerdeStore.com and use the discount code Renegade to get 25% off. And I promise you, your life will be better. And and this is, this is why I love our profession. I, this is why I love historians and I love what I do as a historian <laughs> is that we do what Michel Foucault did, right? He takes a truth claim like that, you know, uh, an essentialist truth claim and just writes the history of it. He just asks, oh, well, for the moment, let's just assume it didn't come from God or you know, from a blade of grass in nature or something like that. Let's, let's trace the genealogy. Let's, let's look back in time, which is exactly what Samuel Moyne does in, in your books with this concept of human rights. You go, you take it all the way back. And then of course you find, oh, no, it actually didn't come from God and didn't come from nature. It came from particular people and their minds in particular times for particular purposes. And then on top of that, this is another thing that's great about what we do as historians, we are interested really only in change over time. You know, we don't think of anything as static and fixed, you know, which is one thing, again, I love about our field, our profession and our way of thinking, right? And so what you did was you found, not surprising at all to me, was a ton of change over time in this concept of human rights. Right. Um, and you also found quite a bit of nuance, um, which for me, it's sort of like, that's what you had to do and should have done. And that was your job as an academic historian. Um, I can also sometimes find it slightly frustrating because I kind of want to cut to the chase and do the p- politics here, right? <laughs> but, totally. but, but I absolutely applaud the work that you put into this to make, to give the fullest by far story of this very important concept in the history of international relations and, and in American history. So I just want to say that out well, front. Thanks very much. So let's, let's do this. And first of all, the first controversy that you address is when this thing started, like when it originated. And I think you and I mostly agree on this. Um, but I mean, to me, there's like, there's roots both in ancient Greek philosophy and in cre- early Christianity there's maybe a long hiatus, I think kind of possibly with some things going on in the middle ages. I've heard you say similar things, but then really for you and me, it really coheres and becomes an important part of discourse, either depending on how you look at it, either 19th or 20th century, but certainly by the mid 20th century. Right. And so that's the modern, the sort of modern age, right. Is when it really. We're talking mostly about those, that period. I mean, late 18th, uh, as as a, as someone trained in and still considering himself, uh, uh, you know, interested in European history, right. uh, you got to get in the late 18th century. That's um, true. Yeah, uh, you have Atlantic revolutions that, among Absolutely. other claims, involve the claim that there are at least natural rights in the American case, and and explicitly human rights or the rights of man in right. the French case. Um, 
but absolutely i think it's as as you know it's a modern story once it moves from moral philosophy texts into into kind of explosive high politics but one of your books um, one to debate about like when in modernity what are the different forms of human rights in modern times right so do you see as i do some antecedents in antiquity well, it depends on what, what one means. So, it, 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 you know, everything is about the definition of our quarry. Um, if we mean by human rights the idea that individuals hold moral and possibly political entitlements against their states and societies, then I think it's quite hard to find a classical antecedents just right. because... Um, you know, it's certainly true that, you know, in, in a, a play like Antigone, we have someone who's divided between loyalty to the state, you know, Creon and what she wants to do, which is bury this body. Um, and so you can imagine, certainly you can imagine the idea that, you know, she wants to do something that she thinks is moral and politics says no. Does that mean she thinks she has a right to it? Um, not mm -hmm. really. I mean, mm -hmm. she just thinks it would be a good thing to do. Um, and she's willing to pay the penalty, uh, if she's, she wants to, you know, do so. So I, I, that's how I would define human rights, but you know, the, the human rights come out in the West of, of a very classical idea of natural law, which yeah. surely does have antecedents in Greek philosophy and, and Roman, you know, thinking. For sure. And Christianity. I mean, you have a whole book on the connection between human rights and Christianity. And for do, me, that's yeah. it's even more important, right? You yeah, have sort of, I, I, I don't doubt that. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's like a, it's a form of universal humanism, even though, of course, it's not sec it's not secular, obviously, but it's no, a no. there's these claims made about human beings, these universal right. claims about right. what what human beings are, what they need, yes. what they should yes. do, how they yes. should treat each other. Yeah. Which is that it all sounds very much like human rights in 2020. It, uh, it, it has some, so I would, I would take care on that one. It's there's something profound about it, but um, I think we're often tempted to say that human rights are about leaving behind a, you know, par parochial or tribal morality, prioritizing mm -hmm. family, tribe, or nation mm -hmm. for humanity. Mm -hmm. And then it's, you know, we could say Christianity sounds like it's a big input. Um, I resist that narrative just because like all of these kind of um, ancient examples um, of, uh, of universalism are there, you know, Buddhism, mm -hmm. later Islam, um, all, all of them are a, a, about a, an ethic for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, Christianity, I think, is uniquely egalitarian mm -hmm. um, amongst individuals, but I don't think it, it made a big contribution to our modern idea of political equality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, J Jesus, I think, is very himself is very far from the idea that individuals have moral or political rights. Um, so universalism is one thing. It seems like it, Actually, universalism is a dime a dozen in the annals of like moral um, culture and um, way back before Christianity. Mm -hmm. and, and then in a way, it's too soon for a long time for the more specific notion that individuals have rights against state and society. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's clearly in the mix and no doubt. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, with, I'm with you 100% so far. So, you know, I've can't tell you how many times I've had students in my classes say something like, well, Jesus is talking about rights here. <laughs> or, uh, or, or this was, you know, this was, this is an enunciation of uh, rights or it was the right of the Jews to do this such. And you know, what, what's your, what's, when you hear that in classrooms and I'm sure you have that kind of thing, what do you say in response to the students? Um, well, I mean, I think first, you know, I, I make a, a, a lot of use of just language to try to yeah. show them how rare the language that is second nature to them was even in the recent past, you know, mm. and just the phrase human rights in our language, English, is really not spread until the 1970s. So, 
Mm. Um, there's no word for not just right, but nature in the Hebrew Bible. Mm. Um, Jesus is a Jew who basically thinks that like the pr- prophetic um, anticipations of uh, Judaism are, you know, nigh and the king, the coming of the kingdom of God is at hand. And the, 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 that means you better get ready. Um, <laughs> I don't, you know, his, his relation to political, human political authority, you know, is very controversial. He thinks people are going wrong by not caring about the right things and especially the right people, the poor people. Um, but he's also very deferential. Uh, to establish political authority in other ways. Um, You know, Paul famously says, you know, slavery, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, So (laughs) it doesn't matter much if you're a slave, if the world's about to end. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think these are figures who made a spiritual revolution. It took, they're they're crucial in the long run um, for human rights and, and really, you know, all the, much of the morality that, that has become so pervasive in, in modern culture, but it wasn't their goal to, to lead to those outcomes. Yeah. Well, I guess I was getting at like the concept of rights didn't exist yes. then. Right. Yeah. No, I, I would cert that's a briefer way of putting it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, I mean, the concept, look, you, I mean, I know this fairly well, I think you probably know it a little bit better. So I'd love to hear your, the way you would give this mini lecture. What's the, What's the history of the origin of the concept of rights, not human rights, but just rights? Yes. What does that well, mean? So, so in it, I think that there's, of course, there's a debate about that and, and different people, you know, favor different um, moments in medieval and early modern philosophy. Mm-hmm. I, I always tell students to compare the idea of natural law to the idea of natural rights that Thomas Jefferson and our, our, our other favorite uh, mm-hmm. ancestors cite. So natural law seems to be about the objective order of the world, not what individuals get. Um, It's Mm -hmm. singular and rights eventually are not just plural, but they're a long list. Mm -hmm. Um, And natural law is about what you should do. It's about your duties, including your duties to abstain from certain things if they're against nature, like gay sex. Whereas rights are about what you get to do no matter what political or social authority says. So I think they need to understand that, you know, rights are in a way a kind of anarchistic um, idea that, that, that had to have been a challenge for a very long time and were postponed. Um, even kind of amongst those who had a lot to do with their coming, like Christians and the, those who propounded natural law. Hmm. So what did it take for Thomas Jefferson in 1776 to say that God or nature gave us the right to overthrow government? Well, it was, that wasn't, it had nothing to do with Jesus um, and, and, no, and, and the Middle Ages either. Um, it's, it's really a, a more recent development. Uh, wow. Um, I got to wrestle with this one. Are you claiming that the concept of natural rights are inherently anti-statist? No, 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 not at all. And in fact, I would argue that they, they kind of go hand in hand with the, the invention and rise of the modern state. Okay. What's quite amazing is that when we look at some of the early modern philosophers like Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, who propound natural rights, Mm -hmm. Hobbes has won the Mm -hmm. right to life and the right to flee the sovereign if he decides to chase you. Locke says you have a right to property and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they both use this analogy that the individual with rights in the state of nature is sort of like the state in the international order, a like autonomous ent- entity amongst other autonomous entities. And arguably they couldn't have come up with the idea of an individual with rights absent that picture of the international order Mm. composed of precisely modern states. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think if we want to account for how rights came about, no, it's about the growth of the state. Um, But of course, the definition that I'm working with, at least, is that 
in the end, you, at least as a moral claim, it's something that you can assert against the world, your community, mm -hmm. if, if your community is not honoring your rights, but also your state. And it could okay. even, and most explosively, ground an authority to overthrow that state, which yeah. did happen in 1776 and 1789. Right. Human rights movements don't you know, monitor the right to revolt. So which what tells yeah. us something big happened. So what I have found in looking at the history of the discourse of rights is that it is always enmeshed with a discourse of obligations, as yes. I think you've already mentioned, right? Yes. And, and there's a figure who I was unaware of until just a couple of years ago, and I believe you introduced me to him. I think it was you. I think I read you uh, about him. Emmer, I don't know the pronunciation, Emmer de Vattel? Yes, of course, yeah. Um, and Swiss international lawyer. Yeah. Uh, and, and, this, of international law. Yeah. and this guy, am I right, is extremely important in the history of American, in American history, but American foreign relations. Right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, all the founders. Yeah. He was like the guru yeah. of thinking about the law of nations, which right. early right. Americans thought were related to natural law and kind of inherent in all law, including their local law. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's, I mean, and he comes out of Locke, John Locke, right? He's a, he's a Lockean. He's, he's essentially, as I read him, he's trying to apply Locke's ideas, core ideas to international relations. And he writes this yeah. tome called the law of, law of nations, right? The law I think. of nations, yeah. And every, there's actually a, a letter from Ben Franklin during the, the Continental Congress saying, we're all reading the book. We love this book. We just got the order from, you know, just arrived in the mail and we're all reading it. It's fantastic. And Absolutely. can you, can you go over Vettel's argument? So, you know, Vettel is really influential, I think, principally in, in giving us this, this modern idea of sovereign, of the sovereign equality of states, mm -hmm. um, which is not realized in our time. I mean, it's kind of like a fiction because, of course, you know, we live in a very hierarchical world. Right. And, um, and yet we, we tend to say that under the United Nations and especially after decolonization, that state sovereignty is in some sense um, on equal terms. And, and, and that's really Vettel's, I think, biggest contribution hmm. to intellectual history. But he talks about everything. So, you know, they're reading him um, in early America for all kinds of reasons. And I think not the least of them is that they want a state. Um, they want to found a new state and he's teaching them well what does that involve um wh what do you have to do and we, in the declaration of independence when they they basically you know talk about rights it's really a stepping stone to announcing the validity of their act of state making mm -hmm. and so they they wanted sovereign equality just like uh, uh you know later folks uh, during decolonization one all Vitellians in this kind of profound sense. So I think that every brown person in a poor country who has been murdered by the United States military yep, yep. <laughs> um, needs to blame Vitell, at least in part. Okay. <laughs> because, <laughs> and I'm beginning with the Native Americans. Um, yeah. That book is almost a declaration of war on the people used to, who used to be known as Indians. And, yeah, yeah. and that argument comes straight out of Locke, who makes exactly the same yeah. argument, which is this. Oh, this, yeah. and, this is, and this is where obligations and rights are twins in both those thinkers, right? Very good. Very good. Um, which is that for Locke and Vittel, and Vittel basically quotes Locke, it is our godly, and it's all Christian claim, it's our godly duty and obligation to enrich and cultivate the earth and make all people prosperous. Totally and, Locke, and Locke said this straight up and Vettel doubled down on it. Totally there, fair. They, they said there are people in the world, and sometimes they named them and sometimes they didn't, but it was Indians, it was indigenous people, yeah. who yeah. are not cultivating the land, they're just sitting on it in their teepees right. and not, not growing corn or rice or, or sugar cane or anything that's, that's commercially viable, right? 
and, and John Marshall, John Johnson v. McIntosh, you know, downloads that, and you know, yeah. the dispossession of the native peoples is you know legal according to this, you yeah. know, fructification ideology that and they, it's, they're working with. Yeah, and even though I'm like in my bones anti-imperialist, anti-interventionist, mm-hmm. anti-war, it's a powerful argument because if you think about it, you know, it's true. North America was populated by a tiny little handful of people who claimed the entire thing as their own and didn't al- and many of them didn't allow any intruders on it to grow anything on it and look what we can produce from North America right incredible wealth and so what sure. Locke and Vattel and then the founding fathers and every American statesman of the 19th century of any significance said yeah. was this is why we've got to remove the Indians because they're being and this was the great move they made they're being selfish they're right. being selfish they're keeping what could be bountiful crops you know from from the rest of the world they're keep they're yeah, immiserating the world's population therefore these settlers who want to take over and grow stuff or dig holes and find silver and gold underneath where the indians are sitting should be not only allowed to do that maybe even supported in doing that right right, right. no scandalous no that's that's all that's all you know incredibly important but i mean but that comes from this like <laughs> kind of universalistic claim, right? That it people, does. that the right to property, which of course is central in Locke, is yeah. also becomes an obligation. Like you, you have a right yeah, to private happening. property, but you have an obligation to go get some. And the only way to get yeah. some is to mix. This is a famous Locke phrase: mix your labor earth, with yeah. with earth, with the earth or the, or nature, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's double-edged because, you know, Locke's rights claim is that it's in virtue of mixing your labor with nature that, that ownership is created and therefore a right pre-politically to the thing exists. But yeah. it's not just if you feel like working, it's, it's also part of this kind of godly rationale for, um, you know, spreading labor and on other people's lands. Yeah. So... We'll get to this later, but um, and maybe you don't know this. Well, you must know this. You must know David Eichblad's work, right? Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, to me, that's like the end of the story that begins. Yeah. With, yeah. It's a really insightful modernization right? theory and development yeah. of the world. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's certainly a one way of thinking about the end point. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, people don't know this. I'm writing the, my chapter on Vietnam right now. And oh, terrific. A lot of it's, some of it's David, taken from David's book. Another, yeah. a, another Columbia guy. Was he your student, by the way? No, no, no. Uh, I don't think he went to Columbia. Yeah, yeah. He was, he, he, was, Alan, he, was, he was just- He was uh, Alan Brinkley's student. Okay. Yeah, so as, I, as I, with, no, I think he might have finished, you know, before I took an interest in U.S. history. Yeah, he, so he was there just after me, but he and I had the same advisor, Alan Brinkley. But of course, so yeah. He wrote, uh, a bo- he wrote a book um, in which he shows that much of the thinking of American foreign policymakers in the 19th, but especially the 20th century, was this kind of Christian mission, Correct. not just to bring rights to the world, but to bring, and this was the thing, economic, modern economic industrial development. Correct. Which Correct. actually looked more socialist than capitalist, by the way, because it was really about the U.S. military often directly building bridges, building factories, building aqueducts, building all that That's stuff. Right. And the mission in Vietnam, and I didn't even know this until I read his book. I didn't know this at all. The mission in Vietnam, according to Johnson and all of his advisors from Harvard, <laughs> was to what they said, bring the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, the, new, the great New Deal Mekong, Public Works yeah. Project to the Mekong Delta. Yeah. David Lilienthal. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's not just like an idea, but the same guys are deeply involved in both things. So those, so Robert McNamara and all those guys who ran this horrific war that everybody now hates, yeah. they were fulfilling, were they not, what Emmer de Vattel told us we should be doing. Yeah. Extremely interesting, yeah. Yeah, interesting. okay. All right, good. I skipped ahead there, but yeah, so, no, no. Um, all right, so let's go back to um, the history of this concept. Um, sure. So we've got the Declaration of Independence in 1776 in the United States, and then we have the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen in France and during the French Revolution shortly thereafter. Similar in some ways, very different in other ways. The Declaration of Independence is sort of more Lockean in its conception of rights um, and politics and social change. And the Declaration of Rights of Man in France is much more Rousseauian in various ways. But 
and maybe you differ with me on this, but they're both universalistic, right? Humanistic. Uh, they, they appeal to rights that people have in virtue of their humanity. Yeah. Um, justification of revolution and so, to create new states. So, I, so Sam, I've been doing something. I've been trying to do something that's like heavy lifting. <laughs> All right. I've been trying to I've been trying to frame or I should say read the Declaration of Independence as an imperialist document, mm -hmm. um, which is it's tough to do unless you contextualize it. So you got to you have with with the context. I think the case is pretty airtight. <laughs> if it's just textual, it's a little bit slippery. But, you know, the rights in there are, as we all know, you know, we, we all have natural rights, according to Thomas Jefferson, to overthrow unjust rulers. Fine, got that part. But there's another line in there in which it says, people are, don't just have the right, they have, I think it's the duty is the word, the duty to overthrow unjust rulers, oppressive rulers, right? Now, that could be taken as you have the duty to overthrow your particular ruler in your particular part of the world, there's nothing in there where I can totally say this looks like Samantha power saying we should invade yeah. other countries yeah. and bring rights to, you know, yeah. but, but if you look at pretty much 100% of the subsequent history of American foreign relations, starting with Thomas Jefferson in particular, right. Who invents the Marine Corps and then promptly yeah. sends them all the way across the world to Tripoli to invade and, and overthrow a regime there, you know, and then all the way through the 19th century in the Civil War, I argue, was imperialist and colonialist, right? Yeah, right. Really. Um, Reconstruction was a colonial project, you know. Yeah, for sure. So so within that, if you if you take Jefferson's word in the declaration words in the declaration and then pair them with what he did with them and what subsequent statesmen did with them. It looks to me like these cats had from the beginning. And if you look at their earlier work when they were young men, like John Adams talking about America becoming the next Rome and Washington going and killing as many French people as he can find in the woods to make the next Rome. They all loved, the, they all loved Rome. They all talked about Caesar. Uh, it looks to me like, and this is probably, we're going to be pretty close on this. I don't see any moment, I don't see any outlier among American statesmen, foreign policymakers from before the revolution all the way to today that deviates from a globalist imperialist project. <laughs> okay, well, all right, so let's, <laughs> let's get into that. Because, I, I mean, I primarily would want to talk about how we think about the legacy of these American and French revolutions for human rights. And, and you, you've cast it as a kind of, you know, preparation for a kind of contemporary imperialist version of human rights. Yeah. Uh, America announces them and then, you know, kind of, you know, Samantha power executes the plan yeah. later. So I'll just say, a, you know, a couple of things. First, they're, you know, we could, I don't want to exactly debate this because it's a side issue, but, you know, there, there are some um, anti-imperialist traditions in American history amongst whites, sometimes out of white racialist concerns. Oh, uh, oh yeah, totally. No. And, yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. We get into, you know, wh who were those who opposed the Spanish-American War and racists? You know, who were those who were angry about Filipino counterinsurgency and right. who were those who opposed American entry in World War II, which FDR could not get done, even though it led to American global hegemony. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, th th there were some forces that, you know, were very happy with the Monroe Doctrine, um, but very unhappy with U American global hegemony. Mm -hmm. And that was a, you, you know that, but, but, but that's not my field. I'd rather kind of talk, I, I, even if I, I think you're onto something very powerful, what strikes me in the end is that these invocations of rights in 1776 and 1789, and, and remember there's the Virginian, you know, declaration of rights before the, the Declaration of Independence, which mm -hmm. actually lists a, a lot more rights because it's founding, mm -hmm. you know, a, a state government. Um, mm -hmm. they're, 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 they're influential on different people and, and they fit in, in other stories too, because let's just take those events. What are they about? 
Well, you, you announce rights to justify revolution. Yes. Uh, seizing your own destiny, um, acting for the sake of your own people, not the suffering abroad, mm -hmm. uh, not to create a United Nations, but to create your state. Mm -hmm. um, and through violence, if push comes to shove. Mm. Um, and so all the anti-imperialists in Europe, um, you know, who are under, you know, the despotic control of the Austrian empire or the Russian empire, um, they received the American revolution and especially the French revolution as a warrant for, um, revolutionary nationalism. Well, who's the, who's the heir of revolutionary nationalism in the 20th century? Well, it's all the brown peoples that whites have yeah. been ruling. So mm -hmm. if we have a Vietnam War, it's because Ho Chi Minh is so excited about 1776 that on December 1st, 1945, he stands up and gives a declaration of independence for the people yeah. of Vietnam and says, I'm just invoking American ideals, people. Yep. Yep. Um, and so what's amazing is that you get some, some subaltern actors who um, kind of seize on these revolutionary legacies and do something that, you know, was unthinkable before. But I just see the contemporary idea of human rights as very different. Um, so it's not about state making and especially not about um, revolutionary state making anymore. Mm -hmm. It's about um, creating an international regime, sometimes backed by powerful states like the American state. Um, that's about interfering with sovereignty because what is, what is Samantha power not care about? Well, it's the third world sovereignty of those, uh, <laughs> peoples who were able to finally create their own states after right. using their own violence right. sometimes. So, yeah. Yeah. so international human rights today um, strikes me as just like almost the opposite of mm -hmm. what rights meant at the time of the American and French revolutions and really what they meant for most of modern history. So mm -hmm. that contrast has always been at the center of my account. How mm -hmm. did human rights become um, not about grounding states, but about justifying intervention in them. Yeah. How did they become not about revolution, but about naming and shaming uh, and about writing checks and about becoming a human rights lawyer if you're an idealist? Um, yeah. And how did they become about creating an international regime that's about controlling states um, yeah. and making what sure they adhere to the the standards of human rights. Well, those are all mysteries that the revolutions don't solve. See, I think it's big. All that is baked into the original concept. So all right. you do this, you do this great thing. I guess it must be the, the last book. I think you must've done it there where you yep. show, and you just sort of just alluded to it here, but I just want to make sure people are clear about this is it's sort of like, is I would say it's hilarious were it not for the, you know, countless people dead uh, because of right. this, but there is an, an incredible irony going on here in the mid 20th century, which is that human rights, you know, in the mid 20th century paired with the anti-colonial movement is about freeing the brown people from their white oppressors. Yay, we did that. So by the 1960s, that all happens. Now all the brown people have their own rulers. Oh, well, it turns out by the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s, and especially today, oh my God, they picked the wrong rulers in many cases. They picked right. despots, the people that right. Thomas, Thomas Jefferson said they have an obligation to overthrow, yet right. they're apparently too poor and weak and tired to overthrow people like Saddam Hussein or Robert Mugabe or whoever you want it to be. Right. Right. Um, and so we need to go in and help them. Um, yep. So, so the, so, or, or uh, Qaddafi, you know, Muammar Qaddafi. Yeah, yeah. It, it's incredible. So like they go from protecting brown people from the white people to a, to going in and killing the, the brown I people's choices of rulers. It's very powerful. It's very powerful. But it, I just would, you know, I just am interested in the acrobatics, let's say. So, yeah. you know, the American Revolution is pretty violent. You know, ask the loyalists. Mm -hmm. the French Revolution 
you know, is, is violent enough that people are horrified <laughs> by it down to the present. And, you know, mm -hmm. the worst thing you can do in American politics is accuse someone of being a Jacobin. Uh, today. <laughs> Unless you live in Brooklyn. Unless you live in Brooklyn. <laughs> uh, but even in spite of that violence, no one suggested the need for an international human rights movement or regime hmm. after these events to control the Americans who, you know, hmm. are too violent or control the new French people. <laughs> right. Only after decolonization uh -huh. did this happen. So, you know, rights were not a justification for that kind of neo-imperial move until like that other legacy of the American revolution in the form of revolutionary nationalism had, you know, changed the face of world politics. Yeah. So I, I just think that story is important, but in the end, absolutely. It's, there are these continuities you're pointing, pointing out. Yeah. Let me just clarify what I meant when I said that there's been absolute continuity among foreign policymakers on the yep. U S being a global empire. Um, there have absolutely been anti-imperialist senators and Congress sure. people, and, you know, sure. and politicians of all stripes in this sure. country. Um, they have just been always the losers. <laughs> you know? uh, that's fair. I mean, I just would, you know, they were, they were the losers except I, I mean the interwar period. I mean, um, they they were they were extremely powerful and it was it was in part because there were there was a left that was a pacifist left and um you know that the that was inheriting some of these things and moving them in a in a somewhat different direction and you know like the strange bedfellows that you get with you know uh you know William Bora and and Norman Thomas and, and at this time you know who succeed with the neutrality acts yep. in, in really postponing American intervention until yep. Pearl Harbor. Yep. Um, it's, it's, they were not losers. They won for many years. Mm, sure. So I mean, it depends on your timeline. You know, if you ask, you know, a lot of people uh, in 1939, who's winning, you know, I think. Yeah. Uh, no, no, answer. certainly. Certainly, this was FDR's big problem was the so-called isolationists, which, by the way, is a, was a slur. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Invented, but invented by Admiral Mahan to yeah. um, uh, to dismiss critics of the Spanish-American War and the colonization of the Philippines. By the way, so I call them all anti-interventionists. Yeah, I think that's much more appropriate. So the people who were who were powerful in Congress in the twenties and nineteen thirties, who were anti-interventionists, by the way were overwhelmingly conservatives. Now, you know, sure. So you, you talk about the pacifist left, which did exist, but I think sure. the pacifist right was actually much more important here. I agree, in, 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 yeah. in, 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 in the Congress. And yeah. I mean, there still is a legacy of, of, of some forms of Christianity, which you know, um, could take left-wing forms. Um, and uh, you know, I don't we get into like the kind of, uh, you know, Brian Wallace, later McGovern. I mean, these are not, you know, trivial personages. Right, right. right. Yeah, okay. Um, but yes, you're right. I mean, I, for, a, for a little less than two decades, anti-interventionism, I would say, was more dominant. Does that make sense? Yeah. More, po more, powerful yeah. as, more powerful as a discourse. Yeah, I, sure. I, I, that's right. That's, that's, about, right. Okay, that's about it, though. Other than that, it's unbroken. <laughs> yeah. Think, oh, yeah. No, yeah, I, okay. I, think, I think that's... Uh, you know, there, there's, a, you know, there's some intricacy to the story, but yeah, absolutely, it's, it's very grim. And also, you're, and also, you were totally right, and this is a fascinating thing that most people don't know. The leading uh, opponents of imperialism at the turn of the 20th century, main, namely those who opposed the Spanish-American War and the colonization yeah. of the Philippines, um, were racist segregationists. Correct. Correct. And let's think about that for a second here, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a particularist ideology, obviously, right? Um, people are made up of all different, they're biologically different, they're so different, right? The that's right. Black, black people can never be like the us. So therefore, there's sure. no, it's a waste of time to send our good boys, our soldiers over there and try to reform them and make them like us, which is exactly what the project in the Philippines was, right? Exactly, yeah. Um, and so it was the anti-racists who become the big imperialists. And in fact, by the way, did you know that um, one of the big Vietnam 
brilliant boys. I forget which one. I think, oh no, it was Rostow. Walt Rostow. His, one of his major arguments for anyone who was ever dovish at all on Korea or Vietnam, anybody who didn't want to send in the Marines tomorrow was that they were racist. Yeah. Walt Rostow said, what, you just want to leave those poor brown people poor for the rest of their lives? You racist. You know, Dean Rusk at one point was like, do we really want to go all in on Vietnam? And, and Walt Rostow and a lot of these liberals, Robert McNamara, who ran the yeah. Vietnam War, said, you're a racist. We, yeah. the, war, the war in Vietnam is anti-racist, which yeah. There's, yeah. there's an actual logic to that, right? We want to raise yeah, no, those that, people up. That, 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 that is certainly true. I mean, <laughs> earlier, you know, it's, you know, you get racism on both sides. Uh, you know, Woodrow Wilson is not for universal uh, decolonization. Uh, he uh, wants to settle European affairs by giving nations that are white states, which means Eastern European uh, emancipation, but as a good Southern boy is, uh, ha ha has no interest in a, any kind of global uh, decolonization. So he, he, I think, you know, the, even many American internationalists are, are not anti-racist for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So it's really like forms of racism battling of, over these issues. Yeah, what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is that anti-racism isn't necessarily, but is more likely to be imperialist. Yes, yes. Right? I, I, think, I think that's quite interesting. That's yeah, quite interesting. Racists, racists want separation. They want to right. leave other Correct. people alone and they want to be left alone by those, those terrible black people. Correct. I, I think the kind of global history literature tells us that once it seems as if, look, you know, globalization is happening and the colored peoples are coming for us, that, then you can't just stay home anymore. Mm -hmm. You have to establish white rule globally. And mm -hmm. that's really what the British Empire was about and, mm -hmm. you know, other empires. And Americans like Wilson were kind of, you know, on board with that way of thinking. Well, it was also about, it was also about making the brown people white. Some of that, but, you know, at the apogee of race thinking, you know, that wasn't possible for many. So, you know, it, it, it depends who we're talking about, but absolutely yeah. that's a big thread. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the civil civilization of the darker races where, you know, was, was extremely important, but others denied it was possible and they were internationalists for that reason. Yeah. Okay. I think in this country though, I mean, I have not come across, I mean, after night, after 1898 and the Philippines. Lothrop Stoddard. I mean, he's in the great Gatsby, you know, the, the peril of the darker races. I mean, yeah, I'm talking about policymakers. Oh, yeah. Okay. Po well. Policymakers after, after 1898 are pretty much unified in believing with some hesitation early on that yeah. the Filipinos and the Africans yeah. and the Cubans can be raised up to our standards. Good. Right? Good. Whereas the racists were like, that's an impossible project. This is a waste of blood and money. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, all right, let's go to a very important moment in the history of human rights as a concept, uh, 18, nine, sorry, 1948, right? Yes. And, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the, by the United Nations. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. You know, a lot of times when students invoke human rights or activists invoke human rights as if it's, again, natural or God-given, which a lot of people on the left do still, and it's yeah. quite annoying. I say, actually... That whole idea was written by a Canadian, wasn't he a Canadian journalist? <laughs> the guy who actually wrote uh, the document? Well, it, a, a lawyer, John Humphrey, uh, yeah. but he's Canadian. Yeah, he kind of surveyed all the constitutions in the world at that time and said, well, actually, it looks like everyone agrees what the rights are. Here's the list. Mm. Oh, really? Uh, Is that how he did it? That's basically how, how the, the kind of body of the text came about. And then it was sort of reorganized and they got flowery. Oh, because I did get yelled at once um, by uh, someone who might be a friend of yours, um, whose name I'm blanking on, but he's an he's a international relations historian also um, at, right. Occident at Occidental. Um, but anyway, okay. um, in which I was arguing that the whole thing is a is a is a European American concept. Right. And he was saying, oh, no, no, no. Human rights was circulating around the rest of the world before. And I was like, what's the evidence for this? Yeah. Um, do you, where, where do you stand on that? I'm basically with you. I mean, remember that um, there were 58 states in 1948 in the United Nations. Now there are 190 something. Mm. Um, so it, it, it was, I mean, the bulk of those were, were you know, European and Latin American, a few others. Um, 
Now, of course, it's true that um, the global South is 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 um, interested in human rights, doesn't reject them in the early days, and wants to kind of push them. But it, you know, it, it's 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 its main response to um, the UDHR was to say. It all sounds good, but remember, you promised us decolonization. So, right. you know, I always put the 1948 document in in connection with the Atlantic Charter, yeah, um, which seems to promise some kind of decolonization and actually has a much bigger global impact, I think, than the Universal Declaration seven years later. Now, it turns out that you know Winston Churchill, when he met with FDR at Placentia Bay to kind of devise this thing, Mm -hmm. um, thought they were talking about the decolonization of Adolf Hitler's empire, not empire, and definitely not Winston (laughs) Churchill's empire. Right. Um, And and FDR kind of vacillated during the war about what, Mm -hmm. you know, what he was going to do and allow so that by the end, you know, you get Ho Chi Minh saying, but wait, America is an anti-colonial power in world history. I'm, I'm declaring independence mm-hmm. like Thomas Jefferson, but you know, FDR, you know, late in his life lets the British help set the French empire back up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's what leads to the Vietnam war, you know, 25 years later. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's a moment when I think, it's not that the global South wasn't interested in or, or, or even involved, in human rights, but what it prioritized was, let's say, the first right was the was the right to their own states, um, and that just took them several decades mm-hmm. uh, to get. Okay, so in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of eighteen, I keep saying eighteen, nineteen forty eight, um, there's a lot of rights listed. Yes, that are declared to be universal human rights. And the United States was the most powerful member of the United Nations. Some have argued that it dominated it. I would be one of those people, right? In those years, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Created and dominated. Until 19, the late 50s, for sure. And, and it, and it create and, and includes, uh, the UDHR includes, as, you, as you've talked about quite a lot, in particular your most recent book, uh, economic, what we call economic rights. You know, right? They say in there, um, I think, is it education? I don't know. Housing, thing, things like Absolutely. housing, education, housing, health, education, work, uh, our human rights, even rising standards of living. Right. So that's like, and that's Bernie Sanders, like word for word. Yeah. Bernie Sanders is not far off from that, which is yeah. not far off from FDR's second bill of rights speech in 1944. That's right. So, um, now <laughs> that, what I've been finding in my research is that yep. um, beginning in the late 30s, the major foreign policymakers in the Roosevelt and Truman administrations, and then even Eisenhower and Kennedy, um, and then Johnson, and I've kind of alluded to this already, were not just attempting to create a global American empire. They were attempting to create a very specific form of a global American empire, which was a New Deal social yes. welfare state, American yes. empire. Yeah. And that's, that's why to me, the UDHR makes sense for them at that moment in 1948, that why the United States would support such a, ra- it is seemingly radical document. I mean, I it, it, right. it's, it's an attempt to remake the political economy of the entire world. Am I right? I mean, that's- I, I think that's right. I okay. mean, remember that, that um, you know, there aren't that many states at the time and Europeans have already gone kind of whole hog for this welfare state idea. Mm-hmm. Your Americans are now kind of adopting Europeans in the West as kind of the kind of protectors. And in the case of the Marshall Plan funders um, and Latin Americans also want a welfare state. So it's not like, you know, it, it was about a kind of um, image of the good life after the great depression that hurt, you know, hit, hurt so, so many the world over and the Soviets abstained from the UDHR, but, you know, didn't completely reject it. And they were offering a kind of vision of welfare too. And so Americans are in 1948 for this document, 
Um, although, you know, it's not like that many people noticed it, right. to be honest. Um, right. But they're for it because they understand that now they're in a competition with the Soviets, not over whether there should be welfare states, but which kind? Mm-hmm. The kind of more Western kind mm-hmm. or the Eastern kind? And mm-hmm. it's not exactly clear which one is going to provide the goods. And right. the whole world is watching. That's right. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so um, now, I mean, I've heard you say that this was, I mean, you, I've heard you, you're somewhat positive about the UDHR and, right? I mean, and you see it as sort of being replaced by a neoliberal version of human rights later on. And you kind of lam- lament that in a sense, right? Well, so, so the basic take I've come to in my most recent book, which is called Not Enough Human Rights in an Unequal World, is that in, 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 in the kind of early days of my writing on this, I kind of emphasized that the UDHR was not intended to change international governance. It wasn't trying to give Samantha Power something to do. Hmm. Um, on the contrary, the 1940s began the greatest kind of episode in that older history of state making. Um, Most states are, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, come about during the 30 years after Mm -hmm. uh, World War II, and they're supposed to be welfare states. That's what citizens want out of them. Um, But it's not as if anyone yet thinks the UDHR is like a Bible for helping people in other states, Mm -hmm. Um, especially not if they're, you know, living under despotism. There's not one word about military intervention True. in the UDHR. And in fact, the UN charter condemns humanitarian intervention, mm. um, which Hitler, you know, Adolf Hitler had been one of the great proponents of humanitarian intervention in his day, just like Vladimir Putin today. And mm-hmm. so in 45, people were like, let's not get that back. It's just a pretext for imperialists. Um, right. So the UDHR, whatever it was, I think was not about changing internationalism. Um, uh, But I think rather it was kind of just in the orbit. It's part of the music of this period in which the highest ideal was a welfare state. And for me, that what's crucial about that is that Um, in the mix was was more attention to kind of material equality. We know that this same period is also the apex of material equality within places like the United States uh, and other countries too than in the period since. And so I noticed that, you know, the move to this more internationalist kind of vision of human rights coincides with a kind of abandonment of the welfare state since the 1970s. So okay. I've, I've tried to kind of track how did that happen um, in subsequent research. Yeah, right. Okay. And let's we'll definitely talk about that. But I guess I just can't, I can't see it yet, mm-hmm. human rights, the concept as, um, as either a pretext for imperialism or imperialism in itself. Right, because yeah. it's a, it's a form of cultural imperialism. And by the way, oh, there's, okay, there's a enough. really important part of the story of the 1948 UDHR, which is that, which was the opposition of many Muslim countries to it, correct, because correct. it because the UDHR includes women's rights too as human rights. That's right, one, one and, or two Muslim countries. Yeah, but there was there you know, weren't that many. Mainly okay. because there weren't that many. Yeah. Right, but there was uh, there was substantial opposition by non-Western actors, and I think grassroots and state actors were not happy with this because it was very clearly Western Judeo-Christian values. For sure. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't doubt that at all. I mean, I guess my, maybe I'm a bit more favorable towards it because, um, you know, I think, um, what are we trying to salvage? Well, we're not trying to provide apologetics when we attack American domination. We're not trying to, provide apologetics for local domination um, and you know the subordination of men by women is one form of that so it, if if Americans end up spreading some women's rights as part of their empire well that that part we ought to keep 
um, and, 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 <laughs> and see if we can save it from, from, uh, you know, from the rest. But, you know, this gets into very, like, let's say contentious debates about relativism. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I'm personally, uh, you know, of, of the view that like, we, we only make these arguments because we ultimately care about emancipation uh, and defending the freedom of a culture is itself a form of universalism, you know? And so hmm. w ultimately the game in town has to be figuring out, well, what's the right emancipation and who's going to provide it? Uh, I think we agree that America has a mixed record at best, but <laughs> that doesn't mean we, 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 we concede to the oppressors around the world the right to rule for eternity. Yeah, I don't see it as a mixed record. <laughs> I, um, I, I don't, even, even World War II, I see, uh, this is a much longer conversation for another time. No, no, but I, that, that's kind of the secondary. Like, let's say America is just vile in everything it does. That, yeah. that doesn't mean, you know, the Saudis were right to oppose the UDHR. It oh, means that you know. Well, that maybe women ought to be emancipated in 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 all cultures. Well, what yeah. if the what if the women don't want to be emancipated? What if the women believe in Sharia law, right? Well, you know, um, <laughs> which many I, do, many do. I, you know, that's then we get into kind of arguments about false consciousness and so forth. But right again, you know. <laughs> Uh, he, he, the relativist has trouble explaining in the name of what values is he so incensed about mm. uh, universalistic imperialism. And regularly it turns out that he's incensed in the name of his own universalistic values. Interesting. And so I think we just ought to get clear about, you know, where, how are we going to get those advanced in the world? Yeah. But it's, a, I mean, these are huge issues. That's really good though. That was really good, man. That, that's a good uh, rebuttal to my position on these things. Um, and for me, it's about um, a lot of anti-imperialists don't state their own values up front, right? Correct. So it Correct. ends up becoming, it becomes a moralistic stance. It becomes, you're right. It, beco it can become a universalistic, moralistic stance. And I, so what I say is, you know, my value, one of my values is I want to live in a country in which planes aren't being flown into buildings. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In other words, so it's like the blowback argument. Sure. I want to live, yeah. I, totally. I want to live, I want to live in a world in which there are in, in which people don't hate me because I'm an American. That's right. Right. I also yeah. don't want to pay money to build tanks and bomber jets to me go either. to other countries to serve purposes oh, exactly. that I don't see. Right. Uh, I'm with you completely. So yeah. I, I think both of us would like, I mean, we could even say who's going to take care of universalism, you know, whether there ought to be anyone is someone else's problem, but Americans need to kind of get out of the way finally. Um, yeah. And, uh, but I mean, even I'm, I'm with you, you know, well, but, but even saying something like, you know, I support women's e legal equality in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. I'm not going to say that. I mean, because I'm speaking okay. on behalf of other people who I've never met, I will never know. I don't know okay, anything about enough. their. I don't know anything about their lives. I mean, fair who enough. am I? Who am I, white boy? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, and fair. and and you know that a lot of women in those countries absolutely. That's support. right, and there there are powerful arguments to the effect that, um, you know, some forms of feminism, and this I do agree with, are are very tightly linked to Western imperialism, and oh, we yeah. have to kind of figure out if there's a kernel of emancipatory content, why does it get so regularly mixed up in and with empire? Yeah. I totally mean, with you. Afghanistan, right? That was sure. one of the major stories in the Afghanistan sure. war. I mean, that's what the only thing I just would, would the only point on which I would challenge you is that if you're concerned about hierarchy between America and other places mm -hmm. by that very same token, I seemingly you have to be concerned about hierarchy within those other places. And mm -hmm. so, um, or explain why not, you know, wh why is the one your problem and the other not? I don't, um, I don't, I'm not concerned necessarily about hierarchies. I'm okay. simply concerned about being implicated against, okay, my, sure. against my will, right? Fair, fair. In, in what other people don't want happening to them, right? <laughs> Great. 
it, because the Amer- you know I I didn't choose to be an American citizen. I just was by luck happened sure. to be born here. And then sure. the United the federal government in the United States did all these things in my name, and the rest Correct. of the world Correct. sees me, and they can for good reason associate yeah. me yeah. with bombs dropping on their children. Right. Correct. Yeah. No. Um, that, yeah. I so get, I, I get it. So your okay. So your last book in 2018 um, was on uh, was on human rights and neo what you call neoliberalism, and right. and I will say neoliberalism is one of my least favorite terms, <laughs> unless it is used really really carefully, right. uh, because it is so often used not carefully at all. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about here. Absolutely. It's, um, I you think, know, in, in, in yeah. our defense, it was almost not used. Uh, much at all. And then in the aftermath of 2008, and really after that, it, it's stock rose and, and maybe has risen too high. And now there's a bubble. I mean, I've heard it applied to everything from mass incarceration sure. to, to the rise of Donald Trump to of I, much of which makes zero sense to me. But neo, for me, I'll just say, I mean, quickly, like for me, neoliberalism makes sense I believe in its first usage was with the Chile project, right? I mean, I think the the Friedman School, the Chicago Boys going down there and through state power of a very nasty sort, essentially imposing privatization, right? And and so called market so called market reforms, which were actually state managed reforms. So, but to me, if you want to call that neoliberalism, I'm with you and I get it. You know, that right. that makes sense to me. Um, but, well, how do you, I mean, how do you use it? Well, okay, so, uh, so factually, I mean, the term does go back, you know, into the 30s. and uh, Does it really? You're right that, yeah, no, the, um, I think some of the first attested, you know, examples are in the kind of early, um, the kind of predecessor to the famous Mont Pelerin Society, which is called the Lippmann Colloquium. It doesn't really matter. I don't even need to rely on the term. All I want to do in right. that book you mentioned is sort of say, Human rights um, were connected with with the dream of egalitarian welfare states in the nineteen yeah. forties, yeah. and nowadays they're not. Right, uh, they're connected with intervention in the midst of, um, you know, states that are more austere, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and um, you know, it's not just in the north, but. Our, our international financial institutions like the World Bank you know, mm-hmm. spread this ideal of a minimal state mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. to the ends of the earth. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we don't have to use the word neoliberal to describe that transition. I yep. think we can agree that it happens in the same moment um, in the 1970s when the idea of human rights is kind of redefined okay. um, and human rights movements become world famous. And so what I was concerned about is figuring out, well, what is the connection between the fact that human rights and this new idea about governance, um, which is more kind of government austerity, mm-hmm. um, kind of gets popular and gets enforced where it's not popular. Mm -hmm. And actually there are big arguments here. This is why I'm a moderate now because a lot of people say, well, human rights is just um, like the, the rosy, you know, um, language with which um, neoliberalism is sold to the world or imposed on it. Mm -hmm. And I I just, you know, I don't go that far. I just want to say human rights were once, connected to the welfare state and to get at least some modicum of distributional equality. Mm -hmm. And now they're not, they don't Mm -hmm. get it done. No Mm -hmm. one in human rights movements, at least until very recently, even thinks that human rights are about distributional fairness. Um, Even when they, you know, remember that there were these economic rights in the UDHR. So that's the kind of correlation I'm, I'm trying to, get at. And, and the way I've kind of expressed it is by saying, in our day, human rights have been about, at best, building a kind of floor of protection um, for the, the worst off in societies. Um, whereas the dominant economic orthodoxies are about obliterating any ceiling on inequality. 
Right. And so you can see how these two projects, you know, they're not connected, but they could coexist and get along. Mm -hmm. Neither is challenging the other. One's working on a floor, anti-poverty and so forth, of which we're living in the great age. Right. Another is working at the ceiling, destroying it very successfully. Yeah. Okay. It's just, I, I mean, it sounds like you agree with me that human rights, um, so far at least, has never been deployed in a way that you would favor, that you, right, that you uh -huh. cel celebrate. And, and, and so if you add, if you're adding more elements to the concept of human rights yeah. that yeah. everyone in the world is obligated to receive, you know, yeah. Yeah. that aren't we opening even more, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's more danger. Totally fair. I mean, I think okay. there, there have to be some, um, you know, some other stories that aren't about Americans because once Americans become globally hegemonic, like, mm -hmm. you know, there are counter moves and, you know, we've already said like Ho Chi Minh, very, you know, he's not stupid. Mm -hmm. He understands that using the American myth against America and saying, wait, you started revolutionary nationalism. I'm just being an American right. was, was a powerful move. And right. human rights have been powerful, not when, not when imposed at the point of a gun, mm -hmm. but when people try to use them subversively. And right. of course they face limits because they're weak actors. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to celebrate them. And so I'm usually in a debate with people who think we just have to recognize that human rights have brought a golden age. And, and that's clearly false. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't want to say, well, you know, no one ever has, you know, made use of them for the sake of their own ends or for universal ends. Okay. Um, there's just too many people out there and yeah. too many kind of warring tendencies to, to reach that conclusion. I mean, yeah, the anti-colonial movement of the 20th century, sure. What, Ho Chi Minh wasn't the only one. He used this language oh, no, I, in, in, no, no. In, in justifying throwing off their colonial oppressors, right? Which sure. you and I and most people generally support, right? Sure. Um, maybe not the particulars and maybe not the yeah, outcomes, of but, course. Yeah, but of course, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. I, yeah, that's okay. That's a, that's a compelling argument. I like that. I like that. Um, but I just get very nervous, especially now that I've found out that the Vietnam War was an attempt to, you know, extend the human rights of, of modern economic development to the poor brown people of Vietnam, right? So it's like, if you, sure. if you freight that concept with even yeah. more stuff, you're giving, you're giving even more pretexts. You that's know, totally for, fair. For more invasions and more killing. I mean, yeah. the evidence shows that no one in Vietnam, even opponents of the war, you know, um, talked about human rights, but certainly, I mean, it was a, it was a war that liberals supported. I mean, we have to, you know, created tell students, you know, that, you created. know, world war two, the cold war, Korea, Vietnam, <laughs> you know, liberals started all of them. That's right. Uh, so we, 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 you know, and then we get the post cold war moment when arguably, you know, George W. Bush's father, um, is much less bellicose in spite of Gulf War than Bill Clinton, who is beginning to use American power, including in, in Kosovo, mm -hmm. in ways that are going to be very fateful after September 11th, you know, 2001. And Barack Obama is much more continuous with George W. Bush than, you know, different. So I, I'm with you completely there. Yeah. Um, let me say that, okay, um, so my big argument here, uh, see what you have to say about this. <laughs> I, I don't see how you could love it, but um, is that progressive and imperialism are two sides of the same coin. So that progressivism, meaning, meaning in its original, you know, early 20th yeah. century, right? Yeah, sure. Um, is the idea, and it's also Christian, right? The idea yeah. is yeah. we are obligated, once again, obligated to, um, help our neighbor right to uplift to what's the be our brother's keeper in obama's yep. phrase yep. right yep. um and so that's not just you know the progressives during the spanish american war and world war one were saying to each other hey we're not just obligated to uplift the poor in the ghettos in new york and chicago Correct. of Correct. course there's there's poor people all over the world that we have to save and uplift and that's why that's precisely why they most of them supported the spanish american war and world war one 
intervention in those too. Yes. So, yes. and that you see even today, you know, there, that kind of, that kind of got tamped down after Vietnam because the liberals took a kick in the gut with Vietnam. And so they stopped right. talking in these ways. Yeah, but in, right. in, in recent years, you've seen yeah. more and more of this talk about, especially with Afghanistan, well, we are obligated to uplift those people. Yeah. We, you know, it's, sure. self, it's selfish of us not to invade of other course. countries. <laughs> and that includes women for propagating women's yeah. rights, by the way. Yeah. And by, by the way, has anyone, I was going to ask you this, I don't know the answer to this. Have, have people done analyses of the gender of all this stuff? Because it's, it's very significant to me that like it's been recently, it's been Hillary Clinton, Susan Rice, Samantha Power, and Madeleine Albright, you know, are the most yeah. famous yeah. proponents of humanitarian yeah. interventionism on, often on behalf of women in other countries, yeah. right? Yeah. Is it, no, it's a, um, you know, th there, there, there is no kind of standard work. Um, okay. and, of course, a lot of men are, are, were with them, but, um, you know, it's, it's sort of well known that, um, at the time of the Libyan intervention with which we began, mm -hmm. Maureen Dowd wrote a, a very nasty New York times column where she says, remember how people predicted that when women got power, they would end war. Yeah. Uh, well, not exactly. And she called th that those folks and mili military muses mm. um, and it's an interesting story um, yeah. and and there's certainly critical scholarship about um, liberal feminism and 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 u.s interventionism um, right. so there those are those are important topics okay um, cool you know i don't think they exhaust um the you know women's movement by any means and you know uh and uh, and yet it, it, we can't overlook those um, those episodes. Even even Code Pink, do you know this? For a while, supported the occupation of Afghanistan on those grounds. Even Code Pink, that, that's extraordinary. It was. You know, extraordinary. I I in my new book, I have a chapter that um, the Obama chapter. It, it, the secondary character is Medea Benjamin, who. Yeah. Uh, is in charge of Code Pink, but I did not know that fact that you've mentioned. Uh, look it up. It's in. Uh, I wrote a piece for the Daily Beast. All right, right. I'll check maybe, it out. maybe ten years ago. You can okay. start there, and then. But yeah, they did. I forget. At one point, they supported the the occupation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, so, all right. This this has been great for the the historical piece, and I've learned a lot from this, and I'm sure the audience has too. So, you're working with the Quincy Institute. I am. Yeah. Tell us about that. Uh, well, you know, I've uh, I've uh, you know, had uh, some some great uh, friends at Columbia who uh, are actually, you know, several of us are involved with it. And, and at, at one of the heads is Stephen Wertheim, who I take it you're going to interview in a yeah. future show. Yeah. Um, so I've, yeah, I've been, um, it, yeah, after my human rights scholarship, I've been working on American war and its history and mm. especially how, um, claims about the humanity of the way that Americans fight have played a legitimating role, especially um, in overcoming some of the initial complaints after 9-11 about mm -hmm. torture and so forth. And right. My worry there is that if we focus on the inhumanity, the torture and the civilian casualties, we we're kind of removing bugs from the program of war, not kind of disrupting the program um, fantastic and so you know quincy is providential because it it's it's really a breath of fresh air and in a landscape in which both of the major political parties are quite committed to uh, um, um you know american um militarism uh, yeah. and so you know it's it's early days and you know you can strike only a limited blow with an op-ed but uh you know, Stephen and I had a launch piece in the Washington Post um, called Infinity War, which, you know, some of your listeners might like. And, uh, you know, the general goal is to see, you know, how far these kinds of alternative views about what the American state should be doing can, can make inroads. Um, and uh, we'll see what happens. But it, nothing like it really existed in my youth of the 1990s or even more recent decades. No. And um, I think it reflects an exhaustion. Some of the forces you mentioned um, 
and uh, and and yet, you know, also an alternative of Americans who, you know, like you and I, just don't want to be identified with a country that is, uh, you know, um, you know, doing these things the world over um, mm-hmm. anymore. I love what I hear to be your argument in this new book, because uh, I've been saying this for a long time, and you're the oh, only great. other person to say it. I think I heard, if I heard you right, this obsession with things like Abu Ghraib, right? Correct. Yeah, right. That's and, it's about. Yeah. and, uh, even to some extent, like the drone. Yeah, no, no, definitely the drone warfare aspect. You know, Absolutely. You know, b- both of which I think are horrific. Don't get me wrong, Correct. but Americans focus on those things, get very exercised and worked up about that. And Correct. then sort of don't talk too much about the fact that, Oh, for instance, Correct. just recently there was a full scale ground invasion of two cities in the middle East. Correct. And we have heard no reporting about that whatsoever. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people had to get killed there. But also just as, as you said, the overall machinery of war, right? The That's Iraq right. war, right. I oppose the Iraq war, not because of Abu Ghraib, but because of the Iraq war. Of course. Of course. <laughs> yes, I love that. Absolutely. Um, you know, Abu Ghraib is, I think, and when we look at it, I've tried to do it in one of the chapters of this book, really kind of a, an, a story of the anti-war movement that wasn't. Um, as you say, you got lots of li- liberals, not just conservatives who are, very happy with the Iraq war in 2003. Yep. It's beginning to go south, but you know, on patriotic lockdown after 9-11, these people, um, first of all, realize they've made a mistake. They're not pure. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're looking for an indirect way to score points against the president um, without kind of renouncing the need for a war on terror. Mm-hmm. And Abu Ghraib and the specter of torture, it, while horrendous, are perfect uh, in, in this strategic moment when you're not ready, not willing to attack American war, but uh, mm-hmm. can make hay of the way it's fought. And what was the consequence? Well, mm-hmm. under Barack Obama, we got a, a war in which that, that kind of brutality is edited out, but it extends in time indefinitely and expands in space. Uh, really without limit. Beautiful. I, I, I adore that argument. Thank you for making it. Yeah. Um, I can't wait for this. This is the book. This is your next book. It is. It's, it's uh, coming out in spring 2021. Oh, I, and fantastic. And I can't wait to read it. Uh, last thing on the Quincy Institute, um, for those of you who don't know, um, it was somewhat controversial. I guess still is controversial for its funders, uh, which I found to be really exciting, actually, even though I am not a particular partisan of either the Koch brothers or, or George Soros. Yeah. I thought it was really great and encouraging that those yeah. two um, forces on very different sides of many political questions joined in opposing at least the, the form of American empire we have now, right? Correct. You, Correct. How, did, how do you feel about that? I mean, and do you, have you changed well, you know, your mind I, about the Koch? I haven't seen a dollar of it, but uh, you oh. know, those two who do, kind of have chosen to devote their lives to it need to survive. And it's, you know, the, the money is a means to an end. I I think, um, I I think, you know, if you want to say something more favorable about the funding, you say, well, it harks back to this period um, in between the wars when aspects of the left and aspects of the right converged. Yes. Um, And, you know, until we can kind of, propagate these views and make them more mainstream you have to start somewhere and you know um we have to you know take care and make sure that the source of the funding isn't controlling its use um but you know i have implicit trust because i know them and in the kind of prime movers uh, behind this uh and the kinds of attacks they've gotten um i think are are kind of exciting because it suggests that people are worried right. um, that th- that the United States is ready for this message after all these decades. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, I'd, some of the stuff from Quincy is not quite as radical as I would like it to be, but I'm a of very radical. I'm a very radical guy. But in general, sure. in general, I think it's a fantastic shift 
Right. And it's so overdue, my God, for the, for the few of us who actually care about these things, foreign policy, right? right? Correct. It's, it's a wonderful development and you're totally right. It harkens back to the old alliance between the old, old left and the old right on these questions. Yeah. And it's, I think it's very positive. So I, I hope it continues and I hope you guys keep churning out this good work. So well, thanks. We'll do our best. Thank you, Sam, for joining me on this. This has been really, really, really wonderful. I honestly, this has just been like food for my soul. And I think awesome. the audience no, is probably... great to chat and uh, yeah. hash things out. Cool. All right. Well, I hope to see you around in some place okay. somewhere yeah. and uh, we'll talk later. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sam. Bye-bye. All right. See you later. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To experience the new Renegade University, go to renegadeuniversity.com. Thanks for listening.